Welcome back to the studio, guys. This month, thanks to the jumping views and interactions with wonderful viewers like yourself, I'm hoping to do much better in my personal November challenge. That is to post at least three videos that cover some more basic core techniques or concepts when either working with your art and art materials, or in this case, dealing with clients. Thank you guys so much for your support by liking and commenting and sharing this video. So with that, Welcome to the first of my November challenges. Today's challenge is from Johan Lieber who asks, I was amazed I wanted to know more about how you approach to make something that you have a very high pre-expectation of drawing. I understand it's quite complicated and I'm referring to clients' expectations as well. How do you approach it with confidence every time? I had to kind of giggle deep down inside because I don't always feel as confident as I come off in my videos, there's often a lot of second and third and fourth and eighth and tenth takes when I'm recording. But before we get into that answer, I would like to just remind everyone watching and listening that a larger portion of my viewing audience are not subscribed to this channel. So if you find value in either the topic at hand or the artwork that I'm working on, please feel free to hit that subscribe button and sign up for notifications. Now in reply to Johan's question about how do you get your confidence up so much, I'm going to give you guys a really huge resource uh, set of resource materials. And that is the book Art and Fear by David Bales and Ted Orland. I'm going to, um, basically the concept of this book, it's all the thoughts that get into your head when you're making art that either make you stop and afraid to make mistakes? Are you afraid of dealing with your clients? Are you afraid of what your family will say? It's all the things that get in your head that talk you out of being confident in showing your art. So again, that book is Art and Fear, Observations on the Perils and Rewards of Art Making. So the first thing I would advise all artists of any media is to remind them that art is a subjective topic. What I find beautiful may not be the same thing what somebody else finds beautiful. Many would consider art to be a luxury item which is unnecessary to survive. So my first piece of advice would be to not expect everyone to love your art. Do not expect every potential client to be gushing with accolades when discussing their purchases. I personally am not a huge fan of modern art and uh, have been known to get into quite a bit of trouble with uh, potentially security for making some very um, off-color remarks uh, in museums and at uh, art shows because uh, I, I have trouble personally having a filter when I see a two foot by two foot canvas that looks like it was painted with a paint roller and not wanting to make a bunch of smart remarks about it. So while psychologically art and the appreciation of art is something everyone needs, it does not provide any of the three basic physical things that humans need to survive, that being food, water, and shelter. Therefore, for some, art is useless and holds no value. It is not a stable, marketable investment. I know I just made that sound really overwhelmingly difficult, but understand my father was a very practical person. So while he could appreciate art, specifically that man had Remington wildlife painting calendars in his house for his entire life. He did not endorse a career in the arts for any of his daughters in a straight artistic field. Case in point, my older sister changed her major in college from graphic art design to teaching art. So to my father, learning is necessary, art, eh, not so much. I bring this up because critics of your art may fall into one of not many categories of psychologies that support their behavior and their pattern of thought. If you want to skip the big long lecture and the hurdles you may face selling your art, showing your art, feel free to click on the link I'm featuring below. Charisma on Command is a wonderful psychology channel that breaks down the attributes of different people, characters, and situations, and it shows you how and why you may find different people more or less likable, confident, or charismatic, and then gives you tips on how to improve on your own personal, maybe shortcomings, if that's how you'd like to put it. 
I found this channel to be very helpful in breaking some bad habits that I personally have when communicating with others, whether they are coworkers, clients, or just a stranger on the street. One of the traps that the vast majority of artists fall into is associating their art as an extension of themselves. This leads many potential artists into being afraid to show their art or to pursue a passion that they find very fulfilling. The same is true for musicians. I know a lot of very talented, closet musicians who are very well versed in one, if not more than one, instrument, or are wonderful singers and yet satisfy that creative itch by closing it off from everyone and not allowing anyone to critique their ability or their performance, thus inhibiting their growth. At the core of the issue is not that you will never be good enough or that you can never improve, but the pain of the rejection itself. As humans, psychologically we are pre-programmed to want to be accepted. Like it or not, that is hardwired into you. People survive together for food, shelter, protection. Not being accepted by others means that you may not be able to kill that deer that will feed your family, and that when a storm comes destroying your shelter or the place that you live, you will have no help and nowhere to turn. To have adequate protection from the elements. Those are the same primal sources that give you your fear with something you create. Not selling your artwork at a show or to a client means you might not be able to pay for your rent, put food on your table, or pay your phone bill. If you're not even looking to sell it, the rejection can hit just as hard, but with less physical consequences. People finding flaws in your work means that you didn't see it, that maybe you're not right, that you can't measure up, that you personally are flawed and therefore you are the one getting rejected, not your work. One of the practices that I got into even in high school was destroying pieces I didn't like or I didn't feel measured up to my expectations. Now before I just said paper to fire, it's important to note that I did look at the aspects of my art that I didn't like or what I thought needed to be improved upon, what I felt short on. Sometimes it was the composition, the color, the concept, or the execution. Sometimes what was wrong could just be out of my reach and rather than spend countless hours brooding and staring at it, trying to figure it out, it was just more productive to stop it all together and start all over and more likely on a completely different piece. Sometimes even in a different media, which is why I work in so many media. Sometimes it's the media itself that gets me frustrated. This is a practice that many artists employ when they hit a roadblock and therefore have several unfinished pieces in their closets. It's also the source of the saying that for every masterpiece there are hundreds of first drafts that hit the bin. So you are not defeated when you fail. Failing to continue trying is when you're defeated. And continuing to learn and grow as an artist or as a human being is how you evolve. As an artist you create your own style. Things that you incorporate and like into your work. They may be elements you stole from other artists. As a person, it's elements of strength and character that you admire and therefore emulate. Something you saw someone do, how they handled the situation or responded under pressure. But always remember that they too had to learn that technique and master it before they could do it as well. We all have to learn to excel at the things we do before we have mastered them. An old boss of mine used to say, we all put our pants on one leg at a time. That was her way of reminding me not to be intimidated by rich people who are more powerful than I was. We all make mistakes. Another point I feel to, is important to bring up is being realistic in your expectations. Don't set that bar too high. Know your limits and accept that you're not a photocopier or a camera. In commission contracts with clients, I specifically have a phrase that covers this to make sure the clients understand that they're hiring an artist, not a photographer. Writing up a contract to me is very important to cover both you and your client should goodwill and communication break down. I've heard from many artists over the years who had to learn the hard way how important contracts are when they've been burned by a lack of payment or wanted to fire a particularly difficult client, which is a thing you can do. I'll post a link to the video on contracts here if you want to go check it out on maybe not in this video. 
but make sure you and your client are on the same page about their expectations versus your skills as an artist. Another factor is time and practice when we're talking about confidence. The more you do something, the more comfortable you're going to become doing it. Take time to do pieces for yourself to see if you can do them. Try different subjects, different color schemes, different species, breeds, poses, and views. Push the limit of your imagination and your talent. That's why it's so important to keep a sketchbook. You don't have to show anyone, just practice and push yourself. Study different artists. Figure out what they did, how they do it. Perfect your craft. When I started, it was because my in-laws really pushed me into doing something with the talent I had naturally, rather than pushing it down and telling me it was a waste of time, which is what I grew up with. But to be honest, it was years before I could talk to clients comfortably, hundreds of pieces before I had enough confidence in my own techniques and style, and just vending shows put me on edge. Sometimes they still do. There was many a cat show with complete strangers being dragged up by my mother-in-law, asking to see my drawings with me shaking with nervousness, not knowing what to say, and just inside, just begging her to stop. <laughs> But I'm glad she didn't, because I would have given up. And back in the day, there wasn't a YouTube website to go to, marketing, art coaches, uh, or anybody with the savviness to help me understand how to get better and more comfortable at selling my own art. So in a way, I envy a lot of young, expiring artists, because you guys have the resources you need, and it's a lot easier with all the access you have to those resources with the internet. Now you're going to have the rude, jealous person who goes out of their way to cut you down, yell at you, call you a fraud, tell you you have no skill, quit dreaming, get a real job. Teenagers who laugh and giggle and make snide remarks as they go by. And honestly, they're the outliers. They're not the people that are actually going to commission you. And I wouldn't take those critics of your art so seriously. Let them roll off your back like water on a duck's back. Just blow them off. When I'm dealing with new employees at my day job, some of which have never had to wait on the horrible faces of the Karens of the public, the grouchy old men who can never have a pleasant thing to say, and the ungrateful thieves that will scam you right off the clothes from your back, it's a bit intimidating. Many are shy, not wanting to earn the ire of an ill-placed attack while they're just trying to learn their jobs. Trainers stand over them protectively, knowing how mean and stupid some people can be. At work, we call it rhino hide. It's a protective tough layer that you grow that keeps all the jerks of the world away from hurting that vulnerable, emotional inner self. It's the strength of being able to laugh off the insults and the lies. It's going home at night knowing that you can have a good night's sleep even though someone told you you suck. It's the ability to not take those comments personally. Waiting on the public when you're selling someone else's product is hard. Doing it when you're selling your own stuff is something out of a Hitchcock film. I've seen many an artist not make it through their first day, run home crying, and give up completely. Set up beautiful, expensive displays. Not sell a thing, get frustrated, and quit. Some who are starting out have extremely high prices, are very arrogant, rude and conceited and saunter over to me, make rude mean girl type comments about my setup and strip back to their booth and learn that someone who was watching their behavior and then had no problem telling them that their work was great but their personality was toxic and that they weren't going to have a sale today. Some attacks on the public can be very personal and it can destroy your confidence. I've even had to call security at one show to have a member of the public removed. But that's not everyone, and you have to take the bad with the good. Practice treating people as you would want to be treated, and treat your potential clients like your new best friend. They could become a new collector. Now there's no shame in deciding waiting on complete strangers is not your thing. I know a lot of artists who have agents out there that sell their work for them, who are a little bit more business savvy and don't have to worry about taking home the burden of judgmental comments about the artwork. So there's no harm in trying and then deciding you personally can't do it. With as much work as goes into each show, just making arrangements, setting it up, not selling anything on a bad weekend, maybe not enough gate, 
it can be enough to turn quite a few artists away saying it's just not worth the hassle and I personally have been there a few times. I mean it's easier to work with galleries or sell online and sometimes that's the decision that's just easier. I would also like to add when taking commissions that it's ultra important to listen to your client. I can't stress that enough. If you need to take notes, take notes. I take notes all the time and my contracts is full of spots where I can take notes, scribble and work through rough layouts and grind out ideals while the client is still there. If need be, ask if you can record the conversation so you can go back later. Some may approve, some may not. But really get to know your clients, inside and out. I had one client who was very self-conscious of her weight, but insisted that she be in the portrait with her pet. I want to remind you guys that I do not do people portraits, I do wildlife. Now I worked with her husband during my day job, so the job reference actually came from him, not her. The initial contact with me was over the phone, so I had enough time to at least go on the internet and research some tricks photographers use with clients who are of a heavier bill but are trying to hide their weight or trying to make them look slimmer. He gave me some ideas and while I dreaded doing the piece, as I am very intimidated by drawing people because I don't feel I'm very good at it, I was very upfront about my lack of experience and that I might not be the artist for her. There was another pet portrait artist in town who did much more work with painting people than I did and openly offered that might be a better suit for her. She set up the appointment anyway, so at least I went through the options for poses of the portrait, laying in the pluses and minuses to each layout, and I left the ball in her court. Secretly, I was praying I was off the hook and I didn't have to do the commission. But she called a few days later and set up the photography session for the references. Because we were using her home for the lighting, we had discussed how I would have to adjust it. After I finished the work and I was there dropping it off, I couldn't help but ask why. Why had she not gone to a photographer with professional lighting? There was one only two blocks away. The shoot would have been cheaper than the artwork, and her response was this, because simply the photographer couldn't turn back a clock, and the artist can. I argued that photoshopping would easily fix all the things that seemed so wrong with her cat, which was of advanced age. She smiled and said, then I'm not really hiring a photographer, I'm hiring an artist, aren't I? Well, you know what, I had to concede that. And if I'm hiring an artist, why would I want people to think I hired a photographer? I had to smile, and I relented the argument. It was her choice, and she had valid points. I think I did a horrible job. And I still have trouble looking at that piece to this day. But she loves it. The last link I'm going to put here is to part one of the Jasper series. Watch all the parts if you wish, but the first part in particular is about the importance of listening to your client. Like really listening. Even if it's not a memorial, be in the moment with your client. And if you're doing a portrait, I don't see any harm in asking if there's aspects of the subject the client would like to avoid or that they personally don't like. Getting all that out there opens up the discussion for different types of layouts, techniques, and lighting ideas. Be very realistic with your clients, because if you oversell yourself, it can come back and hurt you later. Have a portfolio of your work handy so they can see other aspects that you incorporate into other pieces. Whether you have a developed style or if you're still developing one. The other bonus to bringing a portfolio is that if they see an idea that you incorporated into another piece, they may ask it to be incorporated into their piece. As I'm working on a commission, I always keep my clients abreast of the work as it comes along. Even if it's eight hours of painting and it's only some minor detailing, and I can tell and they're like, okay, so you spent hours hours working on this and you did what exactly? We don't go into every job adding those. Sometimes we strike out. Sometimes we get hit hard and the wind knocked out of us and have to pick ourselves up by our screws. But it's not about how hard you get hit. It's about picking yourself back up and those. Determined artists don't quit. They may not get what they want, but sometimes they get what they need. The important thing is to remember the next time you get knocked down, ask yourself, what did I do today?